Hi, this is Hal Blaine, and you're listening to the Rock and Roll Archaeology Project. Or at least you should be. Nick Mason's a gearhead. Nick Mason loves cars, loves to drive. He's built an amazing collection of vehicles over the years. Nick is not a mere dabbler or a dilettante, though. Pink Floyd's drummer has competed successfully at the professional level in motorsports, drove in the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He's also test-driven for major manufacturers, been featured on the show Top Gear, and more. It's interesting, this background, because over and over you hear vehicle stories when you hear about the early days for Floyd and pretty much every other band. In 2021, Dave Grohl produced a wonderful documentary called What Drives Us that compiles amusing and harrowing stories of life in the van. We dropped a link in our show notes for you. For now, suffice it to say, every band has a van and every band has van stories. Even back then, Pink Floyd toured with approximately 800 metric butt tons of equipment. So getting the right whip that would get you, uh, the boys, and all their toys safely to the gig and back home again was the biggest of big deals. Right after signing their record deal with EMI, Floyd took a big step forward. They bought a new Ford Transit. Loaded with extras like double rear wheels, a crew cab, and a three-liter V6. It was a serious status symbol, Nick recalls, the Rolls-Royce of band transportation. Ford introduced the Transit in 1965. They were built in the UK and Germany for those respective markets. But they were American-inspired designs. Bigger, more powerful, with a wider stance and more capacity than anything else available in the UK at the time. The new Ford Transit, stuffed with gear, was also a magnet for car thieves, so someone always had to have eyes on it. One night, uh, this was before they got the Transit, but it still reinforces the point. One night, Floyd keyboardist Richard Wright fell asleep and their gear got nicked. Nick Mason's mum loaned the band 200 pounds, a sizable chunk of money in those days, so they could at least get some of it replaced in time for the next show. Load it up and move it out. All right, everybody in? Right, let's head out together, lads. Until one night in early 1968, on the way to a gig in Southampton, when they just rolled on by Sid Barrett's flat and kept going without him. Tries but misunderstands. Oh, she's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. There is no other day. Let's try it another way. You'll lose your mind and play. This podcast is intended to be education and commentary. It will discuss adult themes and may use coarse language. Pantheon Podcasts presents Rock and Roll Archaeology with host Christian Swain. Music. Technology and rock and roll. With the show. Hey, hey, diggers. 
This short is special. It's a new wrinkle for us. Okay, full disclosure, this is going to be a bit of a commission piece. Yep, we are in cahoots with the Nick Mason of Pink Floyd. We are helping to get the word out on his fall 2022 American tour. But let me have Nick tell you all about it. Hi, this is Nick Mason. I've spent most of my professional life playing drums with Pink Floyd, but now I'm loving playing live with my own band, exploring the early iconic Floyd tracks and now bringing them to the American shores this fall. Join me and my amazing Sourceful of Secrets band on our Echoes tour and listen to Pantheon podcasts for your chance to grab an exclusive front row VIP experience. Hope to see you at the show. Thanks, Nick. (laughs) Yes, we here at Pantheon are offering a chance to upgrade your tickets and go get one right now if you don't have one yet at each tour to a front row VIP experience. All you have to do is go to PantheonPodcast.com, click on the Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets logo to enter your information for the chance at this incredible package. Uh, Even Arnold Lane could do that. Okay, that's the shameless marketing. Well, I guess this entire chapter could be considered shameless marketing, but I digress. So today, we're going to explore a bit of early Pink Floyd. And don't worry, the boys will get their big moment in the big show soon enough. But this short gives us a chance to get some of the early stuff out of the way. The period where the band navigated some very treacherous waters, mostly caused by losing their initial leader, Sid Barrett, and then, by being leaderless, having to reinvent themselves into something else. Luckily for all of us, EMI and the Floyd, the world knows and loves today, were able to right the ship and sail to distant shores on the dark side of the moon and beyond. But before all that, there was Sid and pre-Dark Side Pink Floyd. So, let's jump on our bikes as we set the controls to the heart of the sun. We give you Secrets from a Saucer. He was childlike. He was kind of wonderfully innocent. In a sense, what we would unkindly call a space cadet. I mean, to tell the truth, I always doubted whether the man was capable of cooking himself a piece of toast. But when I first knew him, he could play the guitar, that was for sure, and quite well. Anyway, I can remember Sid, you know, calling out chord changes for the band. So they worked on new material. They were pretty funky at the beginning, like any band, you know, but they got better over the years, obviously. That's friend of the podcast, Sam Cutler, former manager of the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead, and a rock and roll swashbuckler from way back, quoted in his 2010 memoir, You Can't Always Get What You Want. Fun fact, we didn't know till recently, turns out Sam Cutler and the guy we're featuring today, Nick Mason, our old mates going back to Floyd's early days. Sam was talking about Sid Barrett, painter, guitarist, and singer-songwriter, neurodivergent prodigy, a target for faraway laughter. Sid Barrett wrote most of the songs on Floyd's debut, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and it was a solid debut with good reviews, decent sales, and a top 30 hit single. After that, though, things went south for Sid. In the end, as we've seen, he wasn't dropped from Pink Floyd exactly. They just stopped picking him up. But leading up to that, the other guys, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, newcomer, David Gilmore, and of course Nick, were patient almost to a fault with Sid. They needed him. Sid wrote the songs. (laughs) 
Interstellar Overdrive, with its noise rock guitar riffing, reminds us of the Velvet Underground. It was a Sid Barrett composition, central to Floyd's first album and a staple of the live show. For singles, Sid came up with whimsical, weird little tunes touched with dark humor and laden with psychedelic imagery. Like Arnold Lane, Floyd's first single. It's a bouncy little ditty about a local cross-dresser who snatches women's underwear off the backyard clotheslines. For a while, it worked. Record sales were solid, and Floyd was building a loyal audience with their live shows. About 200 gigs in 1967. That new Ford Transit got quite the workout. But as 67 came to a close, it was becoming untenable. Their first tour of America was a bust. They canceled the East Coast leg because Sid couldn't hang. It couldn't live up to the commitments. An appearance on Pat Boone's TV show was especially infuriating. Sid was weirdly, passively uncooperative on set. He fucked it up for everyone and offered no explanation, let alone an apology. Uh, Decades later, you can hear the anger and frustration edging Roger Waters' voice when he recalls the incident in an interview. Back in the UK, Sid's drug use hit truly alarming levels with disassociative breaks with reality on a regular basis. They tried to get him help. Uh, Roger Waters drove Sid to North London to see the eminent psychiatrist R.D. Lang, got him all the way to the door of the clinic, but Sid wouldn't go in. Dr. Lang didn't get to see the patient. According to Nick, he did make one observation, though. Yes, Sid Barrett had issues. He was disturbed. His mental health was tenuous. But with their ambition to succeed, the other guys in Floyd might be pushing him there, asking more of Sid than he was capable of delivering. Maybe we were the ones who were mad, Nick summarized in his memoir. I know a mouse and he hasn't got a house I don't know why I call him Gerald He's getting rather old but he's a good mouse You're the kind of girl that fits in with my world I'll give you anything, everything if you want me I've got a kind In Nick Mason's own telling, they all had a tendency to ignore difficult shit and just sort of hope things would work out. It had to be especially awkward for David Gilmore. David was an old Cambridge chum of Sid's and Rogers. He was brought in as a second guitarist and vocalist to compliment Sid Barrett. That lasted for a few gigs. Sid would wander around, fiddle with his tuning gears, ignore the audience and the other musicians. Uh, It truly was bizarre. Then, well, maybe Sid could stay home and write. You know, kind of like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, while the band toured without him. Eh, that wasn't going to work either. Finally, one evening in January of 1968, the Ford Transit, packed with gear and guys, and headed to the gig, rolled by Sid Barrett's flat, and just kept on rolling. So that's a Floyd favorite of ours, a deep cut that even some fans don't know about, Fearless, from Metal, Pink Floyd's third album. Wait, what? Third album? Metal's like their sixth album. It's right there in Wikipedia. (laughs) Well, yes and no. (laughs) There were three Floyd releases between A Saucer Full of Secrets, released in the summer of 1968, and Metal, which dropped in the fall of 1971. But they don't really count. And our source on that is no less an authority than the members of Pink Floyd themselves. Moore, Umaguma, and Adam Hart Mother were, respectively, a soundtrack album, a double album that was one half a live record, a really good live record, and one half solo projects from each of the four guys, and another soundtrack album. Simply put, they were workshopping in public figuring out what to do for material in the wake of dropping their principal songwriter. Lots of starts and stops and experiments. Some of it was 
brilliant. Uh, a lot of it was forgettable. But each time, they learned something. Pink Floyd spent the better part of three years like that, figuring things out. Now, Metal, the third real record, is where it comes together, where their bold experimental spirit leads to some great results. Back in Chapter 15, when we talked about the Beatles and their development, we said that there would have been no Sgt. Pepper without Revolver first. Revolver marked a clear transition. Similar thing here with Floyd. Without Metal... Uh, there's no dark side of the moon. Now, their record company, EMI, gave them time and room to experiment and allowed them to develop, which strikes us as very odd, very un-EMI-like thing to do. These guys had sold a few records. They had a following, but commercially, they were nowhere near Beatles territory. How'd they get that kind of clout with the label? Simple. They paid for it. According to Nick's memoir, the guys agreed to a smaller cut of record sales from EMI, 5% rather than 8 in exchange for that smaller cut, unlimited studio time. Normally, we would say, dudes, what were you thinking? Money, it's a hit. Don't give me that too goody good bullshit. Get yours and don't apologize. The music biz is fickle and your time in the spotlight is fleeting. But given where Pink Floyd was at that point, uh, with uh, no proven songwriter now that Sid Barrett was gone, and given their experimental ethic and general disdain for commercialism, it seems like a defensible move. They played a long game, invested in their own future. And, oh yeah, in the end, it paid off. Roger, David, Richard, and Nick did just fine financially, thank you very much. So... Metal, when Roger Waters emerges as the principal songwriter, is album number three for Pink Floyd. That's our story, and we're sticking to it. And we're sticking to this part, too. Metal is a superb album, a small masterpiece that holds up just fine when you compare it to what comes next for Pink Floyd. Gilmore, Mason, Waters, and Wright start an incredible five-album run right there. Metal, Dark Side, Wish You Were Here, Animals and The Wall. That five-album run spans the 70s. It largely defines that decade in rock, and it represents a commercial and artistic peak that even the Beatles could envy. On top of that, unlike the Beatles, Pink Floyd went out and toured America behind those records, and holy shit, those were some epic tours. April of 68, Pink Floyd made it official. Sid Barrett was no longer in the band. At the same time, they cut ties with their management firm, Black Hill Enterprises. Black Hill considered Sid to be the front man and principal talent in the group, so they retained him as a solo artist. Oh, um, by the way, which one is Pink? Sid Barrett made a couple of solo records, and some of the guys helped. Uh, Gilmer and Wright produced and played. Waters pitched in on the first record. Songs like Vegetable Man and Effervescing Elephant had a certain loopy charm, but sales were slight, and Sid wasn't capable of touring to boost those sales. EMI released him from his recording contract in early 72. Not long after that, he retreated to his hometown of Cambridge, where he lived with his mom in semi-isolation for many years. Sid Barrett passed away in 2006 at the age of 60. Sid was no longer in the group, but he kept showing up on Floyd albums all through the 70s. Fearlessly, the idiot faced the crowd, goes uh, line in Fearless, the cut we just played a little while back. Everything under the sun is in tune, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon, is the closing line of Dark Side. Shine on You Crazy Diamond is a long, bittersweet meditation on friendship and loss. What it's like to watch helplessly as someone you love falls apart. 
Oh, we could keep going with the examples. But we want to get to the main course, the impetus for this short chapter. In 2018, just about 50 years on from when Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd parted ways, Nick put together a band in a show called Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. The band has a very interesting and eclectic pedigree, so let's meet the guys. Gary Kemp co-founded and was the guitarist and principal songwriter for Spandau Ballet, the 80s band that helped start the post-punk new romantic movement. Gary wrote Spandau Ballet's biggest hit, True, along with most of their other tunes. Lee Harris has roots in the pub rock scene. He did some guitaring for the Blockheads, yeah, you know, the fellows who did Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. Guy Pratt is a prolific session player, and he was the tour bassist for Pink Floyd after Roger Waters departed. He toured with David Gilmour as well, and he plays on the Division Bell album. Keyboardist Dom Beckin is best known for his work with The Orb, a pioneering electronic music group. So, pub rock, a new romantic, punk, and post-punk, electronic, uh, veteran musicians from different backgrounds and scenes. Their common ground is a love for Pink Floyd's early material, the Sid Barrett era, the transitional period, and of course, Metal, the album that sets it all up. They debuted at Dingwalls in London in May of 2018 and went on to tour Europe that summer and the States the following year. A 2020 tour was postponed due to the COVID pandemic, but in September of that year, they released a live album and film, Live at the Roundhouse. Uh, we've seen it, and uh, love it, and it kills. Saucerful is now back on the road in America, and if you're not able to catch one of the shows, which we sincerely hope you do, watching Live at the Roundhouse is the next best thing. We'll drop a link in the show notes. The shows cover the Pink Floyd era we described earlier, the Sid Barrett days, through to metal, arguably their first truly great album. So there's a wealth of great material to play. The musicianship is superb, and of course, they put together a killer light show too. When he toured with Floyd, the lights and projections and stagecraft was Nick Mason's jam. He was very hands-on with that stuff. Finally, if you're holding out and waiting for an official Pink Floyd reunion, well, you're probably more likely to be hit by a saucer full of secrets in the metal of the night. Okay. Of course, you can catch Roger Waters out in the big stadiums right now, and David Gilmore comes to town now and again playing some big-time Floyd tunes along with his solo material. But as Nick told us just the other day, if you want to see Dark Side of the Moon played in its entirety note perfect, there are a couple of tribute acts that continuously play all over the globe. But to see a robust band playing the original early stuff, well, you won't get that anywhere but from Nick and his band. And he brings along the spirit of Sid Barrett with him, someone the band never forgot, and neither should we. Okay, until next time, diggers, let's leave you with a little of the saucers playing live at the roundhouse we just told you about. And if you want to go see Nick and his band of merry men, get a ticket for the tour stop nearest you, and then go to pantheonpodcast.com to enter the chance to upgrade that ticket to a VIP front row. Don't wish you were here. Be here. And then you will really be keeping up the rockin'. <laughs> Fight on 
Rock and Roll Archaeology is written by Richard Evans and Christian Swain. Produced and hosted by Christian Swain. All sound design and incidental music by Jerry Danielson at Busy Signal Studios. Find all of our shows, notes, and links at PantheonPodcast.com. All songs can be found for purchase or streaming wherever you get your great music. Please pick up these amazing tracks. Contact us on social at Pantheon Podcasts on Facebook and Instagram. Tweet us at Pantheon Pods.